I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanta to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousands more, do not advance it. The father will never. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. They are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but, nevertheless, I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is, I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere major. The first time I saw him he appeared to me like an old lieutenant who had grown moldy under his appalls. But all the Italians are the same. They are like old Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendor. The young man is better, said Danglers. Yes, a little nervous, perhaps, but, upon the whole, he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why, because you met him at my house, just after his introduction into the world, as they told me. He has been traveling with a very severe tutor, and had never been to Paris before. I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves. Do they not? Asked the Danglers. I came, I have said, vivid. He sings. Oh, as I told you before, I think the old fellow is very close. Come, you do not flatter him. I scarcely know him. I think I have seen him three times in. He was telling me this morning that, tired of letting his property lie dormant in Italy, which is a dead nation, he wished to find a method, either in France or England, of multiplying his. It is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers, and my cashier was quite proud of it when I explained to him who the Cavalcanta were. By the way, this is merely a simple question. When this sort of people marry their sons, do they give them any fortune? Oh, that depends upon circumstances. I know an Italian prince, rich as a gold mine, one of the noblest families in Tuscany, who, when his sons married according to his wish, gave them millions. Should Andre marry according to his father's views, he will, perhaps, give him one, two, or three millions. For example, supposing it were the daughter of a banker, he might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son. Then again, if he disliked his choice, the major takes the key. But do you wish to marry Andrea, my dear M. Danglers, that you are asking so many questions? Mafoy said Danglers, it would not be a bad speculation, I fancy, and you know I am a speculator. De Morcerf and I have talked about this marriage, but Madame de Morcerf and Albert, you do not mean to say that it would not be a good match. Indeed, I imagine that Mademoiselle Dang de Morcerf, Mademoiselle Dangler's fortune will be great, no doubt, especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes. Oh, oh. I do not mean her fortune only, and Madame de Morcerf to your dinner. I did so, but he excused himself on account of Madame de Morcerf being obliged to go to Dive for the benefit of sea air. But still, if Albert be not so rich as Mademoiselle Danglers, said the Count, you must allow that he has a fine name. So he has, but I like mine as well. So, Andre Cavalcanta to him. Albert de Morcerf. Still, I should not think the Morcerfs would yield to the Cavalcanti. The Morcerfs. Stay, my dear Count. De Morcerf has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcerf was a mere fisherman. And then he was called Fernand. Only Fernand. Fernand Mundigo. You are sh I have heard that name in Greece, in conjunction with the affairs of Ally Pasha. Exactly so. This is the mystery, said Danglers. 
I acknowledge I would have given anything to find it out. It would be very easy if you much wished it. How so? Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. Chapter 67 The office of the king's attorney let us leave the banker driving his horses at their fullest speed and follow Madame Danglars in her morning excursion. We have said that at half past twelve o'clock Madame Danglars had ordered her horses and had left home in the carriage. She directed her course towards the Faubourg Saint Germain, went down the Rue Mazarine, and stopped at the passage du Pont Neuf. She descended and went through the passage. She was very plainly dressed, as would be the case with a woman of taste walking in the morning. At the Rue Guinegaud she called a cab, and directed the driver to go to the Rue de Harley. As soon as she was seated in the vehicle, she drew from her pocket a very thick black veil, which she tied on to her straw bonnet. She then replaced the bonnet, and saw with pleasure, in a little pocket mirror, that her white complexion and brilliant eyes were alone visible. The cab crossed the Pont Neuf and entered the Rue de Harley by the place Dauphine. The driver was paid as the door opened, and stepping lightly up the stairs Madame Danglars soon reached the salon. There was a great deal going on that morning, and many business-like persons at the palais. Business-like persons pay very little attention to women, and Madame Danglars crossed the hall without there was a great press of people in a mem, de Villefort's antechamber, but Madame Danglars had no occasion even to pronounce her name. The instant she appeared the doorkeeper rose, came to her, and asked her whether she was not the person with whom the procureur had made an appointment, and on her affirmative answer being given, de Villefort's office. The magistrate was seated in an armchair, writing, with his back towards the door, he did not move as he heard it open, and the doorkeeper pronounced the words. Then, when he had assured himself that he could neither be seen nor heard, and was consequently relieved of doubts, he said, Thanks, madame, thanks for your punctuality. Thirty thousand two hundred sixty womit is a long time, madame, said the procureur, describing a half circle with his chair, so as to place himself exactly opposite. It is true, then, he said, rather uttering his thoughts aloud than addressing his companion. It is true, then, that all our actions leave their traces. So when I look at this room, whence so many guilty creatures have departed trembling and ashamed, when I look at that chair before which I now sit trembling and ashamed, oh, it requires all. And I, he said, I feel that my place is not in the judge's seat but on the prisoner's bench. 30,263 mu, said Madame Danglars. Yes, I, I think, sir, you exaggerate your situation, said Madame Danglars, whose beautiful eyes sparkled for a moment. The paths of which you were just speaking have been traced by all young men of ardent imaginations. Besides the pleasure, there is always remorse from the indulgence of our passions. And, after all, what have you men to fear from all this? The world excuses, and no, if my brow be severe, it is because many misfortunes have clouded it. If my heart be petrified, it is that it might sustain the blows it has received. I was not so in my youth, I was not so on the night of the betrothal, when we were all seated around a table in the Rue du Corps at Marseilles. But since then everything has changed in and about me. I am accustomed to brave difficulties, and in the conflict to crush those who, by their own free will, or by chance. It is generally the case that what we most ardently desire is as ardently withheld from us by those who wish to obtain it, or from whom we attempt to snatch it. Thus, the greater number of a man's errors come before him disguised under the spacious form of necessity. Then, after error has been committed in a moment of excitement, of delirium, the means we might have used, which we in our blindness could not see, then seem simple and easy, and we say, why did I not do this, instead of that? Collect all your courage, for you have not yet heard all. Ah! exclaimed Madame Danglars, alarmed, what is there more to hear? You only look back to the... 
Well, picture to yourself a future more gloomy still certainly frightful. Perhaps sanguinary, the Baroness knew how calm Villefort naturally was, and his present ex How has this terrible past been recalled? cried Villefort. How is it that it has escaped from the depths of the ten of this a light heart clung to the count when he mentioned the dear spoil found beneath the flowers. Well, no, madame, this is the terrible news I have to tell you, said Villefort in a You must not weep. No, you must not groan. You must tremble. What can you mean? asked Madame Danglars, shuddering. I mean that de Monte Cristo, digging underneath these trees, found neither skeleton nor chest because neither of them was there, neither of them there, repeated Madame Danglars, her, neither of them there, she again said, as though striving to impress herself with the meaning of the words which escaped her. No, said Villefort, burying his face in his hands, no, a hundred times no, then you did not bury the poor child there, sir, why did you deceive me? The child was born, was given to me motionless, breathless, voiceless we thought it dead madame danglars moved rapidly as though she would spring from her chair we thought it dead he repeated i placed it in the chest which was to take the place of a coffin i descended to the garden i dug a hole and then flung it down scarcely had i covered it with earth when the arm of the corsican was stretched towards me i saw a shadow rise and at the same time a flash of light I felt pain. I wished to cry out, but an essy shiver ran through my veins and stifled my voice. I fell lifeless and fancied myself killed. Never shall I forget your sublime courage when, having returned to consciousness, I dragged myself to the foot of the stairs and you, almost dying yourself, came to We were obliged to keep silent upon the dreadful catastrophe. You had the fortitude to regain the house, assisted by your nurse. A duel was the pretext for my wound. Though we scarcely expected it, our secret remained in our own keeping alone. I was taken to Versailles. For three months I struggled with death. At last, as I seemed to cling to life, I was ordered to the south. Four men carried me from Paris to Challens, walking six leagues a day. Madame de Villefort followed the litter in her carriage. At Challens I was put upon the Somme, thence I passed on to the Rhone, whence I descended, merely with the current, to Arles. At Arles I was again placed on my litter, and continued my journey. My recovery lasted six months. I never heard you mentioned, and I did not dare inquire for you. When I returned to Paris I learned that you, the widow of M. de Nargonne, had married a mer danglers what was the subject of my thoughts from the time consciousness returned to me always the same always the child's corpse coming every night in my dreams rising from the earth i inquired immediately on my return to paris the house had not been inhabited since we left it but it had just been let for nine years i found the tenant I pretended that I disliked the idea that a house belonging to my wife's father and mother should pass into the hands of strangers. I offered to pay them for cancelling the lease. They demanded six thousand francs. I would have given ten thousand, I would have given twenty thousand. I had the money with me. I made the tenant sign the deed of resolution, and when I had obtained what I so much wanted, I galloped to Autuel. No one had entered the house since I had left it. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. I ascended into the red room and waited for night. There all the thoughts which had disturbed me during my year of constant agony came back with double force. The Corsican, who had declared the vendetta against me, who had followed me from Nimes to Paris, who had hid himself in the garden, who had struck me, had seen me dig the grave, would he not one day make you pay for keeping this terrible secret? Would it not be a sweet revenge for him when he found that I had not died from the blow of his dagger? It was therefore necessary, before everything. It was for this I had annulled the lease. It was for this I had come. 
It was for this I was waiting. Night arrived. I allowed it to become quite dark. I was without a light in that room. When the wind shook all the doors, behind which I continually expected to see some spy concealed, I trembled. I seemed everywhere to hear your moans behind me in the bed, and I dared not turn around. My heart beat so violently that I feared my wound would open. At length, one by one, all the noises in the neighborhood ceased. I understood that I had nothing to fear, that I should neither be seen nor heard, so I decided upon descending to the garden. Liston, Herman, I consider myself as brave as most men, but when I drew from my breast the little key of the staircase, which I had found in my coat, that little key we both used, I seemed to be going mad. At last I mastered my agitation. I descended the staircase step by step. The only thing I could not conquer was a strange trembling in my knees. I grasped the railings. If I had relaxed my hold for a moment, I should have fallen. I reached the lower door. Outside this door a spade was placed against the wall. I took it and advanced towards the thicket. I had provided myself with a dark lantern. In the middle of the lawn I stopped to light it. Then I continued my path. It was the end of November. All the verdure of the garden had disappeared. The trees were nothing more than skeletons with their long bonny arms, and the dead leaves sounded on the gravel under my... My terror overcame me to such a degree as I approached the thicket that I took a pistol from my pocket and armed myself. I fancied continually that I saw the figure of the Corsican between the branches. I examined the thicket with my dark lantern. It was empty. I looked carefully around. I was indeed alone. No noise disturbed the silence but the owl, whose piercing cry seemed to be calling up the phantoms of the night. I tied my lantern to a forked branch I had noticed a year before at the precise spot where I stopped to dig the hole. The grass had grown very thickly there during the summer, and when autumn arrived no one had been there to mow it. Still one place where the grass was thin attracted my attention. It evidently was there I had turned up the ground. I went to work. The hour then, for which I had been waiting during the last year, had at length arrived. How I worked, how I hoped, how I struck every piece of turf, thinking to find some resistance to my spade, but no, I found nothing. Though I had made a hole twice as large, I thought I had been deceived, had mistaken the spot. I turned around, I looked at the trees, I tried to recall the details which had struck me at the time. A cold, sharp wind whistled through the leafless branches, and yet the drops fell from my forehead. I recollected that I was stabbed just as I was trampling the ground to fill up the hole. While doing so I had leaned against a laburnum. Behind me was an artificial rockery. Intent on my right I saw the tree, behind me the rock. I stood in the same attitude and threw myself down. I rose and again began digging and enlarging the hole. Still I found nothing. Nothing the chest was no longer there. Thirty thousand. Two hundred sixty-nine of the chest no longer. Think not I contented myself with this one effort, continued Villefort. No. I searched the whole thicket. I thought the assassin, having discovered the chest, and supposing it to be a treasure, had intended carrying it off, but, perceiving his error, had dug another hole. Then the idea struck me that he had not taken these precautions, and had simply thrown it in a corner. In the last case I must wait for daylight to renew my search. I remained in the room and waited. Oh, heaven! 30,271 when daylight dawned I went down again. My first visit was to the thicket. I hoped to find some traces which had escaped me in the darkness. I had turned up the earth over a surface of more than twenty feet square, and a depth of two feet. A laborer would not have done in a day what occupied me an hour, but I could find nothing, absolutely nothing. Then I renewed the search. Supposing it had been thrown aside, it would probably be on the path which led to the little gate. But this examination was as useless as the first, and with a bursting heart I returned to... However, recovering my strength and my ideas, why, said I, 
should that man have carried away the corpse but you said replied madame danglars he would require it as a proof dead bodies are not kept a year they are shown to a magistrate and the evidence is taken now nothing of the kind has happened what then asked herman trembling violently something more terrible more fatal more alarming for us the child was perhaps alive and the assassin may have saved it madame danglars uttered a piercing cry i know not i merely suppose so as i might suppose anything else replied villefort with a look so fixed it indicated that his powerful mind was on the verge of ah, my child my poor child cried the baroness falling on her chair and stifling her sobs in her handkerchief villefort becoming somewhat reassured perceived that to avert the maternal storm gathering over his head he must inspire madame danglars with the terror he felt you understand then that if it were so said he rising in his turn and approaching the baroness to speak to her in a lower tone we are lost this child lives and someone knows it lives someone is in possession of our secret and since monte cristo speaks before us of a child disinterred when that child could not be found villefort's only answer was a stifled groan but the child the child sir repeated the agitated mother how i have searched for him replied villefort wringing his hands how i have called him in my long sleepless nights how i have longed for royal wealth to purchase a million of a child encumbers a fugitive perhaps on perceiving it was still alive he had thrown it into the river impossible cried madame danglars a man may this portion of the napkin was marked with half a baron's crown and the letter h truly truly said madame danglars all my linen is marked thus thank god my child was not then dead no it was not dead and you can tell me so without fearing to make me die of joy where is the child villefort shrugged his do i know said he and do you believe that if i knew i would relate to you all its trials and all its adventures as would a dramatist or a novel writer alas no i know not a woman about six months after came to claim it with the other half of the napkin this woman gave all the requisite particulars and it was entrusted to her but you should have inquired for the woman you should have traced her and what do you think i did they traced her to challens and there they lost her they lost her yes forever madame danglars had listened to this recital with a sigh a tear or a shriek and this is all said she and you stop there oh no said villefort i never ceased to search and to inquire however the last two or three years i had allowed myself some respite but now i will begin with more perseverance and fury than ever since fear urges me not my conscience but replied madame danglars the count of monte cristo can know nothing or, did you observe that man's eyes while he was speaking to us no but have you ever watched him carefully doubtless he is capricious but that is all one thing i might have suspected he was poisoning us and you see you would have been deceived yes doubtless but believe me that man has other projects for that reason i wished to see you to speak to you to warn you against every one but especially against him tell me cried villefort fixing his eyes more steadfastly on her than he had ever done before did you ever reveal to any one our connection never it is true said he in so low a tone that he could hardly be heard well said the baroness well i understand what i now have to do replied villefort in less than one week from this time i will ascertain who this um de monte cristo whence he comes where he goes and why he speaks in our presence of children that have been disinterred in a garden villefort pronounced these words with an then he pressed the hand the baroness reluctantly gave him and led her respectfully back to the door madame danglars returned in another cab to the passage 
on the other side of which she found her carriage, and her coachman sleeping peacefully on his box while waiting for her. Chapter 68 A summer ball the same day during the interview between Madame Danglers and the procureur, a travelling carriage entered the Rue du Helder, passed through the gateway of No. 27, and stopped in the yard. In a moment the door was opened, and Madame de Morcerf alighted, leaning on her son's arm. Albert soon left her, ordered his horses, and having arranged his toilet, drove to the Champs Elysees, to the house of Monte Cristo. The Count received him with his habitual smile. It was a strange thing that no one ever appeared to advance a step in that man's favor. Those who would, as it were, force a passage to his heart, found an impassable barrier. Morcerf, who ran towards him with open arms, was chilled as he drew near, in spite of the friendly smile, and simply held out his hand. Monte Cristo shook it coldly, according to his invariable practice. Here I am, dear Count. Welcome home again. I arrived an hour since. From Dieppe now, from Treport. Indeed. And I have come at once. And what is the news? You should not ask a stranger, a foreigner, for news. I know it, but in asking for news, I mean, have you done anything for me? Come, come, said Albert, do not assume so much indifference. It is said sympathy travels rapidly, and when at report I felt the electric shock. You have either been working for me or thinking of me, possibly, said Monte Cristo. I have indeed. Hmm. Danglers dined with me. I know it to avoid meeting him. My mother and I left town, but he met here Ermin. Um, Andre Cavalcante, your Italian prince, not so fast. Um, um, you are me. Andrea only calls himself Count. Calls himself, do you say? Yes. Calls himself. Is he not a Count? What can I know of? I, of course, give him the same title, and every one else does likewise. What a strange man you are. What next you say of me, 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 me? Danglers dined here, yes, with Count Cavalcante, the Marquis his father, Madame Danglers, um, and Madame de Villefort, charming people, um, de Bray, Maximilian Morel, and de mem you mean, de Chetu, Renaud. Did they speak of me not a word? So much the worse. Why so? I thought you wished them to forget you. If they didn't, Liston said Morcerf. If Mademoiselle Danglers were disposed to take pity on my supposed martyrdom on her account, and would dispense with all matrimonial formalities between our two families. In a word, Mademoiselle Danglers would make a charming mistress, but a wife diable. And this, said Monte Cristo, is your opinion of your intended spouse. Yes, but as this dream cannot be realized, since Mademoiselle Danglers must become my lawful wife, live perpetually with me, sing to me, compose verses and music. One may forsake a mistress, but a wife, good heavens, there she must always be, and to marry Mademoiselle Danglers would be awful. You are difficult to please. Your father was fortunate. Then, said he, you know my opinion of my mother, Count. Look at her, still beautiful, witty, more charming than ever for any other son to have stayed with his mother for four days at Treport, it would have been a condescension or a martyrdom while i return more contented more peaceful shall i say more poetic have you ever noticed how much a thing is heightened in value when we obtain possession of it the diamond which glittered in the window at marl's or fossens shines with more splendor when it is our own but if thus i shall rejoice when mademoiselle eugenie perceives i am but a pitiful atom with scarcely as many hundred thousand francs as she has millions. Monte Cristo smiled. One plan occurred to me, continued Albert. Franz likes all that is eccentric. I tried to make him fall in love with Mademoiselle Danglers, but in spite of four... A propos, continued he, Franz is coming soon, but it will not interest you. You dislike him. 
I think I, said Monte Cristo. My dear Viscount, Franz, I like every one, and you include me in the expression every one, many thanks. Let us not mistake, said Monte Cristo. I love every one as God commands us to let us return to them. Franz de Epinay. Did you say he was coming? Yes. Summoned by him? De Villefort, who is apparently as anxious to get Mademoiselle Valentine married as him. Danglars is to see Mademoiselle Eugenie settled.